working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast Working Drummer. I'm Zach Albetta, and this week I'm pleased to bring you an interview with a unique drummer and a unique voice in the jazz world today, Mr. Jameson Ross. I say he's a unique voice because he is a jazz drummer and singer, and has been touring the world with his quartet in support of his debut album as a leader. In 2012, he won the prestigious Thelonious Monk Jazz Competition for Drums and shocked the jazz world by using his showcase concert as somewhat of a coming out party as a singer. He also has a long list of credits as a sideman with many of today's jazz greats, including Carmen Lundy, Cecile mclaurin Salvant, and Snarky Puppy. This episode is sponsored by Mapex Drums, and here's my partner Matt Krauss to tell you a little more about that. So in Nashville, there are two great drum companies, Mapex and Sonar, distributed through a company called KHS America. And I recently approached them about the possibility of supporting our podcast, and they said, you know what, come to our office and check out and play this new entry-ish level Mapex kit that we are running a holiday promotion on. Uh, okay. So the idea uh, was more or less, if you dig the kit, talk about it. If not, we'll think of something else. They wanted me to have a real experience, and uh, so yeah, I played it. It sounded great. Uh, Now, it's been a while since my first kit, but I have to say I lucked out and got a great kit for the money, and it got me through college and into my professional playing years. I think those kinds of well-made entry and mid-level kits are hard to find these days, but this Mapex kit is a killer-sounding and great-looking kit. It's called the Mapex Storm, and the kit I played was one up, two down, 12, 14, 16, 18 by 22 kick and a matching snare, Planet Z, Zildjian cymbals, Crash, Ride Hi-Hat, and of course all the hardware needed for that setup. I have to be honest, the kick pedal design was not my cup of tea as it was a heelless plate, but it also tells me that Mapex is not afraid to think outside the box. The street price, as they call it, for all those drums with hardware and cymbals for this promotion is $7.99. Mapexdrums.com is where you can go check out the Storm series and find your nearest Mapex dealer. And I realize that there are those of you listening right now who have moved beyond this level, but if you know a student, a church, or anyone looking for a complete, great-sounding kit, uh, the Storm series by Mapex just might be the answer. So I had a wide-ranging talk with Jameson, uh, his experiences in college and in the Monk competition, his thoughts on the direction of jazz, the history of New Orleans music, a little drummer's inside baseball about tuning and tone, and what it's like to lead a band from the drums. We really covered a lot of ground, and he's just a a fun guy to listen to with a quick mind and a good spirit. Uh, So please enjoy my conversation with Jameson Ross. Where are you living these days? I'm in New Orleans, man. I've been in New Orleans for about about seven years now, six years. Okay. I kind of set up shop here after grad school, and... uh, I never left. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't blame you. That's been your home base, huh? Yeah, man. Where you? Where are you? Uh, I'm in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. Can't yeah. Me. Moved here uh, a little, almost a year ago from L.A. Yeah, man. Yeah, oh. I'm, man. But you know, New Orleans. I fell in love with it because it's for me. It's a way for me to do whatever I want to do musically, mm-hmm. so, and not kind of be uh, pigeonholed to you know one concept or one. Uh, group of musicians or one genre, you know, it's just kind of open here. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So you moved there straight after grad school? Well, no, I went to grad school here. Oh, I went okay, okay. To, uh, undergrad in Tallahassee at Florida State. Mm-hmm. Then I moved to New Orleans about a year after I graduated and uh, got my master's. And I stayed here, man. I was like, you know, it, it, once I got my master's, I was touring at the time. And so it was like the only school. Because I was in New York, actually, for a little minute, for like about a year, mm-hmm. it's changed on and off. And then I was touring, so I couldn't really, I didn't want to commit to a school that was going to kind of require a lot of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, long story short, I, I started working with L.S. Marcellus, and he was over the University of New Orleans program at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I got a, a scholarship to go for free, not yeah. to make, they were going to allow me to keep touring. So it was like, let's go. Cool. <laughs> So you grew up in uh, Jacksonville, correct? 
Yeah, Jacksonville, Florida, man. I was uh, that was definitely the beginning of it all for me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, down in Jacksonville, my uh, my grandfather was a pastor down there uh, at a church, and my whole family was really into music, intensely into music, shall mm-hmm. we say? And um, you know, grew up playing in church like so many drummers nowadays. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So many musicians, um, but my mom actually really saw something and put me into arts programs, man. Starting in middle school, sixth grade, and that kind of deterred me into a different direction. You know, mm-hmm. not de- not negating what I grew up around, but it just gave me more ammo and more knowledge, more perspective about how to go about having a music career. You know? Yeah, yeah. So fr- from an early age, like that was that arts high school. Uh, it was just a high school, or. What a middle school. I went to a middle school art school first wow. it's called Lavilla Middle School of the Arts. Mm-hmm. And then I went to an arts high school called the Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. They, they were actually like a sister and brother, like a big brother, big sister kind of feeder school. Right. And they called them La Soda, La Soda and Da Soda. <laughs> and so, of course, <laughs> you know, the, the, the training was, you know, the facilities and the training was just really special, man, to be able to go to school. Like by the time I got to middle school, you know, they had practice rooms. So I can go and practice in the morning time mm-hmm. or after school. school. You, you know, it was like a very environment, not just having musicians around, but having other artists, you know, having actors, having dancers, having like, you know, painters, having having all kinds of different perspectives of art and being creative around a very young age Mm -hmm. about high school it was even more intense and so i was like ready because it was the same kind of vibe except of course you're older you know you're starting to kind of hone in on exactly what you want to do you know what i mean yeah and uh yeah man that kind of environment with me growing up in church as well as having like uh uh, um a very legitimized kind of like teaching environment and creative like really structured artistic you know environment yeah really kind of shaped me to to the, even the kind of cat I am today. You know? Yeah, I was I was going to ask like what at at what point did did uh jazz become the clear path for you as opposed to hip hop or R&B or or so many other styles that come out of the church? Yeah, man, you know, for me, I think the the jazz I mean, it was for me I think jazz I fell in love with it because of I think the freedom, the expression that, that was taking place, man. Like, I think one of my first records I checked out was like Gene. Actually, no, it was a uh, milestones, mm-hmm. um, miles Davis. Yeah. And then as I started to dive into the lineage of jazz, I started to find out about Kenny Clark, you know, Blakey. I started digging into like Max Roach, you know, it, it, you know, even like Art Taylor. Like I started kind of diving into the jazz lineage of drums. And what I realized, man, is that the j- jazz, is the beginning of the drum set to me. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Uh, the, the the beginning of the drum set starts in jazz. And so for me, it, I became fascinated with the history of it mm-hmm. because there was no like juice and so many secrets. Yeah. Check out that you can find a lot, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and so I would say I, the, just the, the expression, the freedom of expression, and just the way I learn how to play the drums from 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 just from understanding the origin of it i feel like you know really gave me a perspective on jazz and i love for jazz for how it affects my ears and the way i play all kinds of other music you right. see what i'm saying yeah yeah um because to me a lot of my secret tools you know every drummer has their secret tools you know they all have their secret approaches to playing and for me my secret tool is definitely a lot a lie in jazz they're in jazz mm-hmm. a lot of my secret tools it's in the transcriptions it's in the time playing it's in you know the solos the greats for me i get a lot of information from checking out a lot of old records you know right. it leads you into the funk tradition mm-hmm. it leads you into like the, the r&b vibe it leads you all that man it gives you all the ammunition as well as kind of like the perspective for you to be able to really dive into other styles authentically you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. so yeah that's what that's how jazz for me that's that's jazz gave me the vehicle bro it gave me the tools it's showing me that wait a minute this is actually possible right yeah especially with what we have in modern day times i've talked with other drummers about how how jazz drumming is kind of the the key that goes into all the other locks in in music like if you if you figure out jazz drumming um then pretty much every other style is going to be under your hands and under your feet 
Um, and getting the feel and the vibe of those individual styles is, is another thing, but it's all like all of the, all of the physical tools are in jazz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I I couldn't agree more, bro. It's, uh, uh, it's, 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 you know what it is too, man. It's the, it's, it's, it's the history of anything that you check out. When you check out the history of it and you, and you're aware of where it comes from, then you, you understand exactly on what ground it stands yeah you get what i'm saying yeah, it's yeah. like it's like funk it's like when you hear when you hear the first origin like early recordings of funk the mm -hmm. drums still sound like jazz drums they do you see what i'm saying yeah yeah like the dark sound they still have that you know and that to me is the the, the origin of funk they're not playing the drums loud yet Right. They're not hitting the drums really loud. Drums are, at this point, at that point, Maple hasn't yep. come along yet. You yep. know, this. You, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's that like, high tuning, like really articulate. Understanding that it helps. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. So, what drew you to uh, the uh, to Florida State? Was that just your your nearby nearby home? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, man. I was going to Berkeley for school, and then uh, Marcus Roberts teaches. He's a piano player he teaches at florida state university i auditioned there you know florida state i was always a no fan but he also have a really great jazz program as well as a music program in general it's like mm -hmm. probably the best in the state one of the best in the country honestly it's really mm -hmm. great and um for not just jazz but just the overall instruction is top notch you know from mm -hmm. every area um but Marcus has wrote my mom a letter and he really wanted to teach me and he wanted me to study with him. And so I got like, it was free to go to school there. It was a scholarship. It wasn't going to be as expensive as Berkeley. You know, mm -hmm. I was two hours away from home, in-state scholarship. And so I went and made it completely changed my life studying with a piano player like that. You know, yeah. I mean, I studied with a drummer too. Le Leon Anderson who was the guy I studied with, which I still keep in touch with him and have a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. um, but Marcus Roberts, the piano player was really instrumental and in, for me understanding the ethos of how to approach music and how to hear and listen you know what i mean mm -hmm. and how to just, just kind of be you know be be supportive yeah and and and, and as well as with ideas that you know make sense <laughs> yeah 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 um and what was it that made you want to do the uh the Thelonious Monk competition and for, for people, for, for the uninitiated, tell, tell people what the Thelonious Monk competition is. Yeah, well, the Thelonious Monk competition, you know, people call it the Monk competition, shall right, I say. Right. Uh, it's pretty much like the biggest deal in jazz, man. It's, it's the biggest thing you can achieve. And you meet probably every person you need to know who's who in the jazz industry. Um, mm -hmm. You put the entire jazz world on notice. Right. If you're known, it works out great for you. If you're not known, you're all you're all of a sudden known, you know, mm -hmm. it's very, it's a big deal. I mean, a lot of people, Joshua Redman has won it. You, you got people like Gretchen Parlato who's won it, Ambrose, mm -hmm. um, Aki Murase. I, I hope I pronounced his name right. I, Akin, I was just, I just did a gig with him. Akin Musir? Akin Musir. Akin Musir. Akin Musir. Akin Musir. There, you there go. it is. <laughs> Akin Musir. That's his name. Um, but you know, a lot of cats, man, you know, who, who's who won it and has done more than two a career drummer and they have drums in 20 years they hadn't did it in 20 years anyway in 2012 when i won mm -hmm. and basically you know for for a drummer to win it it was kind of like it was a big deal for them to even do the competition for drums it probably was like the biggest highlight of the month competition in the past you know five or ten years for yeah. it to be a drum competition you right. see you know what i'm saying yeah and so i i enrolled in it and of course all of my peers people i know drummer friends you know What's the drum world is small, man. Drummers know each other, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, you submit a tape, a fifteen minute recording, where you have to play a monk competition composition uh with no music. Mm -hmm. So basically you have to play it a cappella, just drums, wow. uh, a monk tune, and then you have to like do the three other tunes all up under fifteen minutes. You know, wow. so it's it's kind of interesting the way they ask you to do it, but they really want you. They want to see who really. They try to separate the men from the boys. Yeah. I noticed that yeah, yeah. immediately what, in, the, uh, in the recording process. What, what monk tune did you play solo? I did crisscross. I'm not hip to that one. Crisscross. Uh, stop. 
The hardest part about the tune is the six bar bridge. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it was a, that's one of my favorite monk tunes, bro. And it's like, I think I did that for the recording, and then I did something really easy at the competition, which is like rhythm and name mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the crisscross one is a trippy one too, because it's it's like it's a part of those like monk tunes, like Brilliant Corners, Thelonious, like all those crazy monk tunes that's yeah, like bro, super what? angular it's and smoking. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, everybody played that. All, all the drummers play literally at the competition like four drummers play evidence like <laughs> you had to know every drummer was gonna like you had to know every drummer was gonna play evidence right. man you know what i'm saying right, like right. It's, it's a drummer's tune mm-hmm. everybody you go to new york in a jam session the drummer is gonna call evidence yeah. you know like yeah. you know but anyway <laughs> so you know, i end up winning bro i end up winning man yeah. and it kind of set my career i was already touring at the time but you know how it is, man. There's so many musicians out here. You know, uh, I was working. I was working with, you know, a singer by the name of Carmen Lundy at the time. Still mm-hmm. working with Ellis a little bit. You know, I was subbing with Marcus Roberts. I was, you know, I was I was able to you know, provide for my family at the, at that time, you know, being a jazz musician, being yeah. a drummer. Yeah. But that c- competition set me off into becoming an artist and to kind of really you know, be able to have a platform to say exactly what I want, want to say. Yeah, you know? yeah. You you might be a, a little bit biased since you since you won the thing, but I'm I'm wondering um, what your opinion is about music competitions in general and, and <laughs> turning music into a competition. Um, do you think it's Do you think it's ultimately good for music? Um, that's a great great question. Uh, I think in this day and time with with what we're faced with uh, uh, as a younger generation, you know, back then they learned the music, you know, through the experience of playing it. They didn't have schools. They didn't have colleges. They didn't have uh, symposiums, seminars, uh, workshops, you didn't have next generation jazz orchestra. They didn't have all these different situations where you can gain a level of visibility and notoriety as well as a level of, um, you know, um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think competition, uh, a competition like the monk competition, man, in today's time, it's a really great way to kind of get a head start in your career if Mm -hmm. you win it. Right. You know what I mean? And so we, we can't act like it doesn't help people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See what I'm yeah. saying? Say, no, say you hadn't say like, you hadn't you can't won act it. like that. Say say you hadn't won it. What what would have been your takeaway from the experience of the competition? Yeah, see, I'm like a very much in that perspective because I'm never gonna like and so if I hadn't won it, I still would have I would have thought, you know, I I say this. I think artistry the, the competition is about artistry. Mm-hmm. It's actually, you know, it's not about you just playing your instrument. That's mm-hmm. the part I would say. My, what I believe in the competition, if I hadn't won, I would say the competition is about artistry. It's about who actually displays the most, who awakes the ancestry of jazz through their instrument. Mm-hmm. Meaning it's not about you replicating the history. It's not about you uh, playing what Max played or playing what, you know, what, what Billy Higgins dealt with. It's not about that. No, it's about you actually having a sound and, and a level of perspective on this art form to create your own. Right. Okay. That's really what it's about. A fully realized and, concept. And I think the judges, yeah, that's what it's about, man. And that's what I think separates out of the judges in that competition because everybody's playing the same thing. Bro, mm-hmm. you can probably imagine yeah. that everybody's probably like, come on, man, everybody's playing sick. It, it's drums. Yeah. So it's like, who's really speaking through the instrument and who has something to say? That's what happens, bro, because it's 15 drummers playing for all, all day long and they have to pick three, top three, and then the three drummers play again and then who that they pick one to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, like it's not just the drums that get you. It's not just your your technique or your double stroke roll or your freaking paradiddle. No, that's it. Yeah. And so you know, it plays a part in there, but you gotta know how to use that, you know? And yeah. that's something I noticed and that's what I would always say, if I hadn't won, I would notice that. 
mm-hmm. you know, even even if I had won. I mean, I, grant, I think because I won, I, it, it was prevalent. But leaving the competition, if Justin or Colin had won the competition, I would definitely have the same thing to say because they all possess a kind of voice on the instrument, you know? I want to talk to you about singing. What... When when did you start singing, and was that was that evolution kind of parallel with drumming? Ooh, well, you know, for me, man, this is this is always funny because I think it kind of it mushes together for me. Uh, mm-hmm. When I say mushes together, I mean like it could have been the piano one day, it could have been the bass one day, it could have been singing one day. Singing was something that's a gift given to me that I was just born with. Mm-hmm. I don't have any formal training with it, uh, but it's also the way I, the way I hear music singing yeah. is the way i hear music like it's the way i hear my approach to playing it's the way i hear it all like when i hear a song i don't hear groove i hear a melody mm-hmm. that's always like that for me it's always notes it's always notes and rhythm melody and rhythm mm-hmm. you know so, so that being said singing to me is something that became a very very uh intricate part of my approach in general it just so happens that I actually can sing. Right. You see what I'm saying? (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Like it's always been in me. I've always thought about music that way. I've always had the gift to sing. It just so happened that I happened to play the drums. I happened to sing and I happened to actually organically create or come up with the concept of using my voice with the drums. Mm-hmm. It's funny because some of the singing and playing time, I like that. So sometimes when you see me singing and playing, some of the stuff I play in my head, that's how I think. Like I have melodies to what I'm playing on the drums. Right. And so now I'm actually using my voice and people are seeing my thought process like very open and vivid right in front of you. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, then you put, you put words to that and then you start singing songs and you start putting this whole concept together and then the next thing you know it starts to become something that i never thought it would be but that's what happens when you're creating something organically you know what i mean mm-hmm. and you're writing uh, some of your own songs right yeah man I, I, well, I, on the last record i had about three songs that were written that i wrote and then i have a new record that i'm, I'm recording in february uh, and it's going to be about 70% of it's going to be original. It's going to be pretty, I'm nice. actually really excited about this new music. Yeah. Um, me and a uh, guitar player, Rick Lawler. Yeah. Um, I think he, he's in Atlanta too. Yeah. He's, he's a friend there. of mine. Yeah. Rick, Rick came here for like a whole week, man. And we jumped right in. And uh, I basically told him that I had this vision of, of creating songwriting again and jazz. Mm-hmm. I said, I want to write songs again and jazz. As yeah. I said, I want to write, I want to be like modern day Einstein and you know you're you're like your modern day American standard writers. Yeah, because we don't do that anymore. We always everything we write now is instrumental, and mm-hmm. so when people write words, they write like poetic kind of things. But nobody like really right. tries to write songs. Like, and, yeah, come on, like like you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. And you can't so, you can't like a, a lot of jazz. You can't sing along with it. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not meant to to affect people in that way you know i think it's it's yep. much more intellectual much more academic um still artistic and creative but it just you know is not accessible the same way a song is accessible i totally agree man i, I complete i noticed it when i when i would sing playing drums at the same time and i would travel i would approach something like in a jazz perspective right and when i sing a song over this past year of touring if i'm singing a song and i'm swinging at the same time that's when I would notice what the power was in lyrics in a song. Mm -hmm. Cause it was like, okay, I'm playing, but it was almost like nobody cares that I'm playing. Mm -hmm. It's zoomed in on the song, on the lyrics, Mm -hmm. like not even the voice, just like they're experiencing the song. And so I told Rick, I was like, I want to write, man. I said, and I, and you know, we started talking about writing and Rick is a phenomenal songwriter, bro. He is. And Rick told me, he said, he said, bro. Yeah, bro. He told me, he said, well, you got to write what you know and who you are. And when he said that to me, it just like a light bulb went off. And and he's right, because when you write, you can't make up lyrics. You can't just like, I mean, you can. The great songwriters can do that. Yep. <laughs> but I think the good, the great songs are vulnerable and real. Mm-hmm. They're like from experience, you know? And, you know, and people and even uh, John Clary, I was in John Clary's band for about a year and a half here in New Orleans. 
And I, I wrote with him for the record as well. And John Clary said the same thing. He's like, you have, have an experience, you have a moment, you have a depiction of your life that you want to write a song. And what happens is you have to, the, the, the hard part about writing a song, the, 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 the struggle is to peel back the layer on your concept of what you experience so far to where it becomes general to the mm. public. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, peel back the layer on, you know, okay, we could talk about social injustice. We could talk about everything that's going on in America right now. We could talk about the, the police brutality. We could talk about Trump. But how do we take that and peel back the layer to what every person in America can understand what we're talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the, you see what I'm saying? Like, like, make a general statement yeah. based on a specific inspiration. Mm-hmm. I think the same goes yeah, for the same goes for drumming um, in terms of like you, you talk about writing what you know and writing who you are as a songwriter. Um, and I think the, the best drummers have a, a strong sense of of who they are and their, their musical identity as drummers. And they don't they don't try to um, to be something they're not. I feel I feel the worst when I try to mm. uh, uh, sort of be someone else for a second. You know, of course you want to emulate other drummers and, you know, steal mm-hmm. shit from them and and uh, grow in, in that way. But anytime I get it in my head, that's like, oh, I'm going to do like, <laughs> I'm going to do a Keith Carlock thing here or, you know, something that's not in me. I, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to do one of them gospel chops thing right here. No, no, I it feels horrible. Um, yeah. And it doesn't come off well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you, man. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's def- I definitely agree, man. It's the same. It's so funny, man, because it's, it's, the, the moment drummers can start thinking more about music than just the drums, mm-hmm. that actually unlocks a lot. Because what you just said was, like, you talked about, you know, Keith Carlock or, you know, a gospel chop or using, thinking about a specific concept to try to go for the funny part is the music always leads you in the right direction. So, yep. Like you have to learn to listen, like you're listening, to music, like you're listening to a record, and you're not on the drums. Mm-hmm. Like that's how you have to learn how to focus when you play. You know, I'm big on that. Like listen, like you're enjoying it. Yeah. Like do not listen, like like you're like you know like it's like it's a practice. Like it's like you know no. You have to listen, like you're in the moment, and you are listening to everything for the first time. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like. You 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 play like that, bro. You surprise yourself. Mm-hmm. You'll be like, "Oh snap!" Like, mm-hmm. and you come, you know. And I mean, of course, you you parallel that with great, you know, practice and technique and uh, understanding your instrument, understanding what your capability is. You know, having clear rhythm. That's one of the things I love about. I think it's very important about drums too, man. Clear rhythm is actually powerful. You have to have clear rhythm. Mm-hmm. I think when you don't have clear rhythm. Nobody understands what you're playing. It yeah. has to be dead clear. Mm-hmm. And you so know? many drummers don't. Yep, I agree. So, so many agree. drummers, not not just in jazz <laughs> or gospel or whatever, but like they're they're hiding the one and you know playing fives and sevens just just to fuck with people. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think there's yeah, a, there's a, there's it's a not place. Clear though. It's like not yeah. Yeah, there's a place for all that kind of stuff, but. But uh, it's a very small place. It's a much smaller place than a lot of drummers think. I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know what? It's, it's smaller. It's small. It's a smaller place for all those you know things to you know screw with people in general. Because most of the time, the music doesn't ask for it. Right. You know. Right. Come on, bro. Like you, most of the time, the music not telling you to just flash all over the section. Like no, yeah. it is not what needs to happen right now. You know, like. The drummers are supposed to be the greatest producers. You're supposed to have. You're supposed to be. You po- you're supposed to be the president. Like you're supposed to be Congress. Like you're supposed to be like. You know. You're supposed to have that. I'm telling you, man. Herbie said that to me, man. Herbie made a statement at the Monk competition about the drummer being the. So, uh, you know, I wish I can find it, bro. It's online somewhere, but it's it's actually synonymous with the Monk competition of when they talk about the drummers in 2012. Herbie's press release. Mm-hmm. says something about the drummer being something very like regal and something that just knows everything that's going on you yeah. know like something like that but long story short you know you 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 as we play our instruments we all practice the same stuff we all want to get technically sound we want to have great sound on the drums that's another thing too that i know a lot of drummers don't have a lot of drummers do not notice how to pull the drums 
pulled the sound out of the drum. Yep. I see that in a lot of gospel chop drummers. Uh, and I'm a bigger guy, so I know a lot of these these gospel chop drummers can, they have a way of playing yeah. and they can get this really dead sound out mm-hmm. of the instrument. And I mean, they, they can play and play some amazing stuff. And I come from that. So the funny part is I know that when I see it. Right. But I also recognize and I have a very light touch. I actually don't play the drums very loud, like right. at all. Mm-hmm. And so I haven't broken a stick in a very long man. I I was with Snarky Puppy for a month and I didn't break a stick one time. <laughs> like that's just my point. Yeah. There's a way to play the drums to pull the sound out of the drum versus to freaking smack it <laughs> to, yep. to the point to where the the sound just goes, you know, like mm-hmm. it's like it's not there, bro. You know, so you know, you know, I, I, I'm a drummer, man. So, of course, I've spent time checking out the same stuff everybody else has. You know, your books, your stick control. Your, come on, man. I know the same stuff. It's just the way you have to use it mm-hmm. to really make some music, I think, is where the perspectives differ for a lot of drummers. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, yeah. As as the story goes about the Monk competition, you you won the Monk competition just playing drums. And. Yeah. The, and every every winner of the monk competition gets to do like a showcase concert, correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. So at your at your concert after winning, you had won just playing the drums, and at your concert you opened your mouth and sang, kind of for the first time, like on a mm-hmm. on a big stage in front of a big audience. Is that correct? That's true. I remember that night. Yeah, yeah. it was. I, I mean, I had sung before. My senior recital in college, when I graduated from Florida State, mm-hmm. my senior recital, I did like a, a two set thing in the first half. I did like a set of like Christian music that I grew up on. Mm-hmm. Where I just sung it, and I, I didn't play drums. I had a percussionist, a guitar player, and a bass player, and a piano player, and we just kind of did kind of like paying homage to like how it all started for me musically. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that was like my singing recital. That's like three years before the month competition. Right. You know? Um, and, and, but so, but for me to take that step in a real, like in a, in a gig where people know me as a drummer, right. you know, that was definitely the first time uh, after the month competition, man. And, uh, yeah, bro. It was scary. I ain't gonna lie. It was very nerve wracking. Because I'm not a jazz singer. Oh, yeah, man. I'm not a jazz singer. And I keep saying that and I make sure people know that because mm-hmm. that's not how I hear music. Like when I check out singing from my voice, I check out people like Marvin Gaye, Donny Hathaway, you know, Lee mm-hmm. Dorsey, you know. My singing influences are not jazz, man. They're nowhere near jazz. Like I don't come from singing jazz. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have training of singing. I come from my first inclination of singing was in church when my grandfather said, here, sing, you know? Uh, and so for me, the stuff I checked out vocally after that was all soul singers. You see what I'm saying? So I don't have any jazz vocal approach at all, one bit. The only level of jazz approach that I have is from the drums. And I understand a lot of the vocalists that come through the jazz lineage because of the gigs I've played on drums. You see what I'm saying? So I, there's a certain kind of perspective I have on it where I'm not utilizing jazz vocabulary with the voice, but I do have an aesthetic that's completely dipped in jazz from the drum perspective, as well as checking out the records, you know, experience from playing with other vocalists. So I understand kind of what needs to happen. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, like, but as far as the vocabulary, I think that's what kind of makes it unique too, man. The vocabulary is definitely not jazz, but you can't help but think that it is <laughs> because of the setting it's in. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of extremely soulful at times, but the jazz listener can love it and be like, oh my God, it's, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of like a weird kind of juxtaposition that works. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, you know, I'm thankful. Now, I, I, like I say, I kind of organically flipped up on it. At first, it was just a few songs I was saying with drums. And then once I started exploring the concept of singing and playing, more songs came about. And then more more songs also, too, what I wanted to talk about, what I started writing about. When you start writing your own songs, it starts to all connect. The drums, it starts, you know, musically, man, you know. Yeah, this is something I wanted to ask you about because I've, you know, I've I've played drums behind a bunch of singers and a bunch of jazz singers. And, 
And I think that playing drums behind a jazz singer in particular is, is a specialized skill. Um, and there's also, uh, I feel like a deep sort of evolutionary connection between the drums and the voice. Um, so it, it sounds, it sounds like those two things are kind of meeting in, in the same body and the same brain in you. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think, I think in general, my experience, my first gig, touring gig was with a vocalist. You see what I'm saying? And so for me, I heard music, I heard the vocalist approach from the jump. Like, I mean, man. And 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 with with a vocalist, something I learned, and just to get more specific about the drums, something I learned playing with the vocalist is that it's not about you playing really soft behind a vocalist. It's mm. about understanding what timbres to use when they're singing. Mm-hmm. It's not it, playing on the bell of the cymbal, depending on the vocalist range, might cut slice directly through their voice. It's, it's not even about you playing soft. And that's the misconception to me of playing with a vocalist. No, they actually want you to be very supportive and very present. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, but it's about how you play. What do you decide to do? Make, you can't comp. At, with 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 an active left hand like Philly Joe when she's singing, maybe mm-hmm. approach it from like almost like a if Earl Palmer was playing swing. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you gotta have a different thing to un- and see. That's the thing I understand what I'm singing. So it's like all these different experiences, understand understanding about music. It all comes to comes together. You know what I mean? Like I man, talked to Todd Strait about this. He's the he's the drummer, longtime drummer for Car and Allison. Um, and he has he has a set of symbols that he only uses with car with Karin. Yep. Those are her symbols. Um, and be, like beyond the symbols, like you were talking about, I I think it 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 goes into the tuning of the drums because the yep. like the range of the voice, whether it's a male or female, the range of the voice can be right on top of the range of the drums. Yep. And if you don't tune above or below that, you're going to be stepping on the singer all night. All night. <laughs> All night, man. I actually hate the way I tune my drums when I'm singing. <laughs> I'll tell you, I do, but it's, I can't help it because of more my voice is. I hate it. I, I, I prefer, especially in jazz, a higher tuning. Mm-hmm. Voice cuts. If I tune where I normally tune at, it's directly in the middle of my voice. I also don't like my drums to ring at all when I'm singing. I don't want no ring. I want it to be like, goom, goom. Like I want it to be directly attack. Because the once that starts, that overtone, I'm sitting on the drums too, man. So I'm singing and I'm playing. So once those overtones starts to happen and I'm singing, it can really screw with me. It can mess with me big time. The bass drum sound. I am huge on bass drum sound. Like, yeah. Probably one of my biggest, my first things I do when I get to any gig, bro, the bass drum. Like, And one of my secret, the head combinations I use, I use the coded ambassador on the front, right? And even on my personal bass drum, and I use the fiber uh, skin on the back with a strip, mm-hmm. one strip on each side. 20 by 14 is my preferred bass drum size. I had a 20 by 12. I'm trying to get, I'm going to have to make me one right now. I used to have one, an old like vintage 20 by 12. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like a slingling kit. I don't even know where I found it at. I think, I think somebody may have re, like remade it or something like that. Anyway, I ended up selling it back when I was in college because I fell on hard times, which, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> So, <laughs> but uh, no, but long story short, 20 by 14, I like the bass drum to be not too dead, but just that dark thump. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, and when I play it open, I want it to like, just a little bit though. Mm-hmm. Just, you know what I mean? Like just enough. And that's why I do the coded ambassador on the front versus the power stroke three, because I don't want it to be loud. Like I, that, that power stroke three Versus the coded ambassador is like a night and day difference of a bass drum head. Mm-hmm. Power stroke three coded. I've tried that. That head immediately is thick, and and every time you hit it, you you know it. It's a bass drum. But if you put that coded ambassador on the front, you'll start to notice that it feels like you're playing a tom. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And that was the thing. Like in my in my twenties or whatever, when I was playing all jazz all the time, I I tried. I tried to get with that bass drum tuning, that really high resonant. It, it sounds like another tom, and it just it never it never felt right because I you know I I didn't start playing drums playing jazz. I started playing rock, 
Yeah. Um, and even though I was, you know, developing my, my jazz vocabulary, that, that high bass drum sound just didn't feel right to me. Yeah. I'm with you, man. Man, first of all, I don't know where we get this high bass drum sound from. Cause when you check out the records, no, man, almost none of them are playing with these high bass drum sounds. Yeah. It's like, like dark growl. Yeah. Like thump. You know, almost funky. A lot of them have high toms, but you're you're right. Not a lot of high bass drum. I don't even know where we get that from. I studied with Kenny Washington for about four months, and let me tell you, bro, probably was the most. If it was probably the most powerful moments, it was probably the most. Put it like this: I gained a lot, but I also disagreed with a ton. <laughs> Agreed with almost everything he said. <laughs> I, also, I also gained quite a bit. Because the guy was a freaking genius. He's he's an encyclopedia for the history of the music. And for what he teaches, it is very valuable. Mm -hmm. You know, even me and Greg Hutchison had a conversation about it. And Hutch said the same thing. He's like, it's invaluable. What he, I mean, it's so valuable what he teaches. You know, mm -hmm. the level of clarity it gives you in your playing, uh, the way you phrase across the drum set. That's the big thing, too. It's not It's not everybody talks about. Have you heard about K-Wash? Yeah, know. yeah. Everybody talks about, you know, his Wilcox and concept and, you know, is, you know, about having clear, clear hands, you know, the, you know, the whole con having the sound out of the drum, which is great. But the one thing that he does when you study with him is he has these recordings, these Nat King Cole records that don't have any drums to them. Yeah. And he makes you play along with them and <sighs> you have to orchestrate. Man. That is the, to me, it is the most beneficial part of K. Wash's teaching because it teaches you how to phrase with utilizing the language and up to, to K Wash's words, utilizing the rudiments, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's really the language is that's all it is. He just wants you to phrase utilizing the language versus just, you know, what you hear. It's kind of like constricting, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but it gives you a perspective of how much you can do. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that you, you brought up Nat King Cole. Cause like you talked about your, um, your vocal influences that are that are not jazz, but now that now that I you mentioned Nat King Cole, like I'm I'm thinking back to watching you play and hearing you sing, and and it's like that's that's in there too. The simplicity <laughs> and and like the cleanness of the delivery in the voice and the drums, because like Nat King Cole trio was clean. That yes. shit was just clean and uh, pristine. Yep. And I I feel the same thing in your band. Man, you bro, this is so deep, man. This this <laughs> this is I've never I don't talk I actually bro, I don't talk a lot of drums with people just because you'd be surprised. People just they want to talk more about jazz and career and records. Nobody ever mm -hmm. talks drums, especially when I started singing. Yeah. It's like almost like the drums, you know, and drummers do. Like Joan, I meet drummers, you know, we'll get into a conversation, but for the most part, everybody wants to know about you know, just my career in general. They never want to know about the drums. Well, really, I'm a musician. I'm a drummer. I spent years playing the drums. Yeah. Before you knew, people knew me as a singer. And, you know, I still play as a side man, as a drummer still. And, and I mean, I don't know how long it's going to be like that. I hope to keep doing it, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it gets tough, as you know, you yeah. know, with being an artist and having a clear schedule and shit like that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, nah, man, it, you know, what you're saying is, is 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 it's it's all a part of you know developing too. Realizing Marcus Roberts was big, man. He was so huge on articulation, especially with the ride symbol. Mm -hmm. That really, that's why when I studied with K Wash, it lined up. It really did. I never forget going back to play a gig with Marcus after studying with K Wash and Leon Anderson, my original teacher. He he was actually a phenomenal teacher, but he was really good at teaching how to hear the music. And so what I mean by that is like how to play, like he was big on transcribing, transcribing time playing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, remember name Dave Potter. Yeah. Dave Potter studied with him and Dave Potter. I mean, when I, when I got to college, Dave Potter was already there and Dave Potter had a room full of transcriptions, bro. Like when I say a room full of transcriptions, like I mean like books of each drummer, like notebooks. Wow intense and leon's program was based on transcriptions and so basically you transcribe probably a transcription a week you take a, it was intense and so i i still have some of my books i didn't transcribe half as near as dave did because i never could get through one transcription in one week yeah and so for me 
it took me about two to three weeks for one transcription. For, he, and that was a whole record, a record a week. Well, not a record a week, like one song. Off okay, the okay. But it's still a lot. Bro. Yeah, the, one song is a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah, and then he make you transcribe the whole song and the solo. Right. Which sucked. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it didn't suck because he changed it. Like the, the if you got to a certain point in your playing, he say transcribe these two choruses and then transcribe and the solo and play the solo. He'll mm-hmm. say, you know, I'll play the head, these two choruses, the solo. Long story short, bro, that level of playing, it gave me a, a lot of vocabulary. It opened me up to it. And I still remember all those records. That's how I got back into those early bebop records, man. Like mm-hmm. Ivan Berlin with uh, with Roy, Roy Haynes and Blakey on it playing. Mm-hmm. Bro, the way they play bebop, bro, nobody's playing bebop, bro. Yeah. The way they sound, nobody's playing bebop. I don't hear that. Yep. Nobody's playing, bro. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Even K-Watch, he's like on some... Hard bop, like post bop, with some clean hands, like it's different. But <laughs> bebop, bro, the way they play bebop, bro, the way Roy Haynes and Blakey would approach bebop was like to me some of the most groid, intense playing that I think I've ever heard still to this day. Mm-hmm. Like we, I think our perspective on bebop is different. I know I'm going on a tangent right now, but I just got to no go. I just remember those records, bro, and I, I, that especially that live at Berlin, bro, nineteen fifty one, I think it is, or either fifty with Dizzy, and it has S one half Blakey, one half Roy Haynes. I'm, I, I'm gonna see if I can find it. Yeah. The way they play bebop is like visceral, freaking like bass drum everywhere. Yeah, like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I keep bringing them up on this podcast, but you you reminded me again of Victor Lewis. Because Victor Lewis plays like that. Yeah, y'all, oh, Victor Lewis. Heavy bass drum, funky grooves, but bebop, but still bebop. Bebop, yeah, yeah, yeah man. We have to manufacture some of those hard life experiences, bro, in order to play the music at a very high level. Mm-hmm. We don't have them. We, we, we actually, we have our personal experiences. We have, you know, everybody has things that they go through. But I personally think we have it a lot easier than those guys did. Yeah, definitely. And so sometimes, you know, our stuff is a little polished for many. It's like, you know, it is, of course it's going to be polished. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. We're, we're in school for jazz. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And it's, it's so interesting. You talked about manufacturing hardship in order to become a better artist because the, you know, the, the, the idols that we talk about, most of them, uh, dealt with with poverty. They dealt with Jim Crow. Uh, yeah. They they dealt with heroin <laughs> or whatever it was. Um, mm-hmm. And we no longer have to deal with that. Most of us. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't want to just voluntarily start doing heroin to become a better artist, you know. So it, that makes sense to me now because I would I would wonder why band leaders would pull that kind of shit. And I think oh. that's that's part of it. It's like we got to put these kids through some trials and tribulations so that they they come out swinging. I definitely think that's why some older pioneers of our music do that. I I, I know that for a fact. I even went and I've spent a good little deal of time with him. I actually, we just did a double bill show in, in, in uh, California with him. And uh, he definitely pulled some mental manipulation. That's how he is, though. And, and he's like, he's, he's at a point now where he's getting a kick out of just like actually manipulating young minds to... To, it's like almost like, cause he's 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 all he's all in the education, but he's almost he's fucking with you by making you think that you got to swing all the time. Mm-hmm. When actually he know you he's he knows you're not gonna do that. Mm-hmm. Like he actually knows that in our generation it's impossible to do that. He's deep, but he actually treats you like you have to. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. He's funny, man. Like, bro, like. He is, and, and what I I see it in him because he 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 reads about how Duke Ellington was. He reads books like the Power. John Baptiste is the same thing. He reads book about like mind control books and shit. Like you know, cats crazy man. Like it's out, bro. It's out, and mm-hmm. I, I'm not like that because I don't have enough strength for that. Man, I got a wife, a daughter. I try to be as normal as possible. Like, right. hey, bro, I can't pay you this much money. It's not there. You want to see? Here you go. Here's right. the budget layout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have time for that. And that, and that, that my point is that's also showing you the difference in today 
and the diff and the difference in the way things were for them. Like, yeah, we're playing jazz, we're playing music, and I'm not trying to be funny. Outside of that, I want to be a great husband and a great father. I want to have a family. I want to have more kids. I want to have you know a good credit score. Like, I want to do the basic stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Besides having wonderful moments of music on stage, and I think you know there's there's parallels there to to the, to, the, to our generation now uh, versus the older generation, especially that young lion group, the group that's right above us, those forty year olds. Yeah, those guys can be assholes, <laughs> big time. You, know? <laughs> you you meet the seventy year olds and they're like, hey man, you watch that game tonight? <laughs> right. right. They talk sports and. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. Still. Nothing nothing turns me off more than than a bunch of musicians who want to talk about music on the set break. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I had a gig Sunday night, and let me tell you, I was on one of those gigs. It was a good gig, but the cats on the gig with me definitely want to talk about music. And and every time I, I do the gig pretty regularly whenever I'm in town, bro, whenever I do the gig on the set breaks, I disappear, bro. Yep. Because they literally want to jump right in talking about, and I'm like, bro, we just experienced some very beautiful musical moments. Yeah. Like, we do not have to force it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And it's on Bourbon Street. Like I said, uh, Irving Mayfield's Club. It's not Irving Mayfield's Club anymore. Have you ever been to New Orleans before? Once. Yeah. And so I walk down the street, go to a sports bar, and I sit at the bar by myself and watch like the, 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 the sports. Love it. I, still, I get back at the gig. It's swinging, it's killing, everybody's playing. And it's not that I'm trying to ignore them. And even Peter, the bass player, knows that I do it. He's like the guy who books the gig. He knows that I disappear. And so this last Sunday, he actually came with me. <laughs> he was like, all right, man, I'm going to go with you. I'm like, all right, cool, come on. Yeah. We went, didn't talk about music the whole time. Yep. Like, I, like, And it wasn't like, it's not, I'm not being funny about it. It's just like, bro, we just played an hour and we're like focused. We're like the the gig is killing. Right. You know, it's like you don't feel that? Yeah. That's all the education and camaraderie we need. Mhm. Mm you know, that's why I like Rick, bro. Rick is a recluse, bro. Rick <laughs> gets off stage, let me tell you. Rick gets off stage. He's like maybe a nightcap. And granted, he's giving his all on stage. Yeah. Rick, bro is bearing it every night. And I do not mind when he gets off stage and he's like I think I'm going to go back to the room, you know, <laughs> watch six, maybe read a book. Yep. Take a back. I'm like, I understand. Yep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, some nights he'll come out, you know, some nights he'll come out and hang. But, bro, like, you know, let's have some balance. Let's just have some balance. Let's be people. Let's be people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know? So uh, speaking of Rick, I, I want to ask you about the cats in your band, because af after you won the monk competition and it's time to like put together a band, make a record, take that show on the road. Um, I think a lot of past winners of the monk competition and a lot of the young sort of, you know, chosen ones that are up and coming in the jazz world, you know, they go to, they go to New York, they put together a New York band, sometimes of like the very high profile cats in New York. And, and that's their record. That's their tour. But you chose to keep your college buddies with you from Florida um, and and bring them along on your on your post monk journey. Yeah, you you know, man, I try to keep it as real as possible, bro. I really do. Like, and I think a lot of it comes from just the way I hear the music. You know, um, I also didn't live in New York, so I don't want to be biased and think that I wouldn't do the same thing if I wasn't in New York. Mm -hmm. But to be real, I never, I never, I never got that New York edge that everybody talks about, yeah. <laughs> which I have my own conversation about that, that I think is completely BS. No, we're, we're going to have it in a second. Cause I had a conversation with Rick about this very thing, but, but finish, finish your thought about, about your boys. Yeah, but I'm not in New York. I'm in new Orleans. Uh, I don't only hear swing. I don't only hear jazz. I don't only hear, you know, uh, this sound, that uh, we, our young generation, has said that jazz is uh, this approach. Therefore, my first thing was to call the guys I had a real connection with musically. The first person I called, funny you talk about Rick, is Rick Lawler. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been telling them before I got a record deal that I want to play with him. I said I want to. He he knows it. We were in Tallahassee. 
any any opportunity, anybody need a guitar player for anything, out Rick Lawler. It can be a gospel <laughs> session. It can be, it can be, bro. He'll tell you. I put him in some interesting situations, <laughs> all because I wanted him. I want to play with him. I felt like he just was special. You know what I mean? He's like the one cat, and everybody is starting to notice it too from the record. The guitar player. I'm like, yeah, he's deep because mm-hmm. Rick can actually stretch. Oh yeah, the spectrum. He can really go, man. Like. Blues. He can really play. Like you give him an arch top, he he can go there. Yep. And I don't even want him to do that on my gig. I don't want the arch top. I want like Rick. I <laughs> actually want Rick in his purest form. Yeah. Right? That greasy electric. Greasy, like <laughs> all the way greasy. Like I'm talking like, what's that place in Atlanta? Uh, front page news with yeah. the chicken biscuit and the gra- gravy. Yep. Ooh. Like I'm talking greasy, bro. So. <laughs> I went to Rick, and I also I needed a little bit of eclectic concept. Chris Pattershaw, the piano player, we and me and Chris kind of cut our jazz chops together. Me, him, and Barry, we cut our jazz. I say me, him, and Kevin Smith. You know Kevin Smith? Yeah. We kind of was like a trio that really cut our jazz chops together, and we really were like digging into the records, and you know. And so I know Chris to be a, a to me a phenomenal jazz pianist, like who has a lot to say. And so I was thinking, okay, we put Chris with that, that it gives me the jazz, right? We put, as far as the band, it's us evolved at this point. Bass, I have a friend, Barry Stevenson, who's actually, he's, he, he came up with us, but he started late. Me and Chris and Kevin we, and Rick, we were all like at times in the same group combo, kind of like the school's combo, you know, the you know how the college has the combo with all the cats in it. Yeah. Barry was not in that group, but he was friends with us because he was in our same year. He started playing bass late, but he has a really, really true hunger for the music, and he has this really interesting vibe about him. He sounds like Wilbur Ware, like and Mingus, yeah, who, who hasn't really, you know, came into the music yet. And so I like that kind of vibe. You know, he also has a very good perspective of just kind of like music in general. And so now I'm opening into Oregon. I have Oregon uh. and Rose on the gig, and for me. The organ, uh, I'm I'm really trying to develop something in jazz, in jazz, and I keep saying in jazz because it, it has to be in jazz for people to really see what I'm talking about. I don't want to. Eventually, it, the music will go where it needs to go. But in jazz, we we slipped up on something on the road one day where we had an organ on the gig, and uh, Corey Irvin, who played at my church back home in uh, Tallahassee when I was in Tallahassee. He's also a jazz pianist, and he has like a really interesting aesthetic to understanding jazz, but also how the organ is used. Not just in gospel, like, but like Billy Preston, like, like I'm talking about like soul organs. Like yeah. Charles was using in his music, the way, you know, the way Marvin uses, the way Lee Dorsey uses it. I'm a huge Lee Dorsey fan, if you ain't picked that up yet. Um, yeah. But uh, long story short, I started putting that concept inside of the ballads, the jazz ballads. And utilizing the organ voice as if it was a string orchestra. Oh, man. And so what happens is it starts to have this really interesting sound where you feel like you're in church. But at the same time, you feel like you're listening to like a 19, like 20s freaking crooner or something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I am obsessed with the organ. I, I fell in love with it like five years ago at the beginning of my time in L.A. Uh, because of a good friend of mine there. And uh, just I've I've continued it here in Atlanta, but what I I realized like in in listening to organ groups more and playing with them more, I realized how deeply ingrained the organ is in in the American musical ear because it's at the church, it's at the ballpark, it's in the living room, it's at the club, it's everywhere. Yeah, country music. Is yeah, everywhere. yeah. It's the American man. This is what I'm talking about. But you, this is deep. This is beautiful, man. Because the next record. Just to give you a peep. The next record is going to have organ all over it. Good. Like, everywhere. <laughs> like, bro, used in all kind of different contexts, used as a, a part player, mm-hmm. but also used as an atmosphere, you know, used as like crunch, like drive. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I'm really big on m- making music with acoustic instruments. That's like, so long story short, with the band, all of these guys are friends, man. We're friends, and, and there's definitely a strong camaraderie that we have because we all know each other from right there in Tallahassee, Florida. We were 18 years old developing together. 
And so we have this approach where they know me. They know how I hear the music. They, they know. I also know how they hear the music, and I want them to actually express themselves the way they hear it. Chris, I'm Chris Patterson, he's definitely a jazz pianist. He didn't grow up in playing soul music. He grew up really kind of playing jazz and hearing like more, you know, Beatles in, the, in his household, you know, more like rock, rock and roll. And basically, Chris came to me the first night of the tour and he was like, man, I'm still trying to figure out how to play with your music. And my changes are definitely soul derivative kind of things. There's some moments of really jazz, but the changes are not your typical jazz changes. And so I told Chris, I said, Chris, I don't want you to play like the music sounds. I want you to put your vibe on the music. Mm -hmm. He's definitely coming out of like a Jason Moran kind of like really a theoretical approach. But I want that. I like that yeah. because it gives perspective to what we're hearing. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. I know Rick's going to give me blues. I know Chris is going to give me this interesting approach full of different, you know what I mean? You know, I want, I know Corey's going to provide a level of like production value mm -hmm. from the, or, you know what I mean? Like they have different aspects and I, 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 my approach with the band is to empower them, but none of them probably people know. And that's what happens, bro. I'm having a thing right now, like with my booking agency, they keep thinking that, that my band is in New York and I keep telling them, no, they're not. Like I don't <laughs> see any musicians, you know, one of the bands I love to watch, Lisa Fisher's band, Lisa Fisher, she sung with the uh, um, with Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. She's the one lady who was with them for like ten years. Her band, full of musicians who nobody knows, and it's not about you not knowing them, but they have completely different approaches than your New York jazz musicians. Yeah, you know they don't have they have a, 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 a almost like a deeper connection to the music other than trying to prove that they can play and hang. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. <laughs> that form so i don't i i never get we were in new york i'm not new york we were in uh, orange county we played a show at um with the double bill with winton and the band kind of got a little uneasy because it was like the orchestra was was playing after us and we we're on the same stage at a really big performing arts center like really huge show three thousand people sold out like big show but like big jazz show yeah and everybody in the band psyched themselves out. And I remember backstage, I love Rick. Rick was like, man, like, you know, this is the moment where we turn it up even more. Yeah. He's like, this is the moment where we really crank it. I was like, you're right. <laughs> that's, yeah. but that's my point. Like, he knew. He felt the urgency. Like, no, no, no. We don't dial back now. Right. We try to dial back up under the jazz. Because yes, that's what happens when everybody went to school for jazz. You got those, you know, yeah. those antlers. <laughs> Rick came out that day and he played the dog crap out of the guitar. <laughs> like it was like he said, "Screw all of y'all." Right. Let's oh. I love it, man. And, I mean, he was bound a slide. It was so greasy. That's what I'm talking about, man. And so for me, those reasons are why those guys are around me and why I I really believe in that band, man. In front of like New York audiences and and among your New York colleagues specifically, like Rick Rick was telling me how when when you play in New York, people come up to him, guitarists especially, and they say, "Man, nobody in New York plays like you," and yep. and it, it's because you know Rick has all the jazz chops and all the jazz language in the world, but like you were saying, he is super bluesy and soulful and greasy, and he he does not hide it. Um, yep. so so the New York people are like. Wow, I re I remember now. I remember what blues guitar sounds like, you know. <laughs> and I, it it reminded me that y like your drumming is the same way. You do not play drums like cats in New York play drums. Mm -hmm. So what what is the reaction that you get from from audiences and from your fellow drummers over there? You know, it's funny. It, it's actually interesting, man. Because um, you know, I remember when I first started sitting in in New York. Uh, Things got real interesting. Lawrence Leathers. You know Lawrence Leathers? Yeah. He was in Lawrence Kansas City for a minute when I was there. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Lo Lawrence is a good friend of mine. Lawrence, to me, represents, like, what a real jazz musician is like, what they were like. He's like, <laughs> like, he's, you know he's what I'm saying? Bo like, born in the wrong decade. Yeah. Like, Lawrence, <laughs> a real jazz musician, like, you just never know. He might shoot you or he might be in jail. Like he's like a real and he can swing and he can play like 
really soulful cat. Like, and let me tell you, I never forget when I first sat in with New York, me and Lawrence, that's when I met Lawrence, and me and Lawrence became really close. And um, the approach, most of New York, the, what, what gets me, what, 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 what allows for New York, a lot of the New York scene to accept me is because they actually, jazz right now, I think is, is starting to tear more away from the tradition, mm-hmm. especially the younger generation. And so for me, some of the, me playing gigs like Carmen's gig, which is kind of a modern vocalist gig, you know, it's definitely modern more so than uh, traditional jazz. When I would go and sit in, we would just be swinging. And there's other concepts to my plan, like just to get specific, like feathering the bass drum. Mm -hmm. New York drummers, the way they feather the bass drum is very different. Uh, And sometimes their sound is light. It doesn't have any ground to it. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're swinging, just playing another tune. Those medium tempos like this. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can tell immediately whether the sound is grounded. You know, like you put Greg Hutchinson on the drums or Bill Stewart on the drums, and then put like, and this is no offense, but put like Kendrick Scott or Eric Harlan on the drums. Yeah, and, uh, those are two, or four drummers from kind of the same generation. Mm-hmm. Greg Hutchinson, Bill Stewart. You hit them swing like at this tempo, it's like, whew. Yeah. It's, oh my god. No doubt. No doubt at all. You hear Kendrick and Eric Harlan play at that tempo. There's a different kind of approach. And there's an absence of the tradition of the music. I, and I know they're, they're giants. I know they're giants. But I'm being honest. There's an absence from the tradition. From tradition pre-1940s tradition. Yeah. And see that, to me, in New York, I think what kind of separated me a little bit because I, I got along with everybody, and, and they love my playing, but there's certain gigs, like when I toured with Cecile McLaurin, like you have to kind of know a little bit er, about earlier music mm-hmm. to play that gig, you know? And not trying to be funny, quite a few drummers of or our, in our generation, you know, they're not as versed with checking out pre-1940s music, pre music, you yep. know what I mean? And so that element... It's to me the one element that has influenced my playing on a completely different level, which is I think if I didn't have that element, I would I would probably sound more like a New York jazz drummer. But it's the early element. Mm-hmm. Stand that, like the early element of swing and the way it felt. Yeah, you yeah. Like, and my my time in Kansas City taught me that. Like I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't. I spent seven years in Kansas City, um, and you know when, when you get hip to you know, early Count Basie and Jay McShann and Big Joe Turner. And Ooh. it's all like, it's all just super pulse, like groove in the pocket. Yeah. Um, and Big Joe Turner, bro, I haven't heard. Oh my God. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. No, go ahead though. Sorry. Um, but I, I think one of the, I had a, I had a, um, I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I had a, a wind ensemble conductor in grad school named Sarah McCoyne. And she said, she said, all music is either song or dance. So whatever you're playing, you got to figure out whether it's song or dance. Because yeah. all music will, will be one of those things and some is both. But yep. I think I think what jazz, I think a lot of jazz, especially in the last few decades, is neither. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that it's, it's, an ex, it's an expressive art form. But when you talk about, you know, the different drummers playing that deep swing groove, you know, some of them think about it like a dance. Some of them think about it like a song, but others don't think about it as either. They think about it as a more uh, ambiguous kind of concept. Mm-hmm. I'm with you, man. And that, and I, I, yeah, I think I love all those guys, but there's a difference. When you hear them play, you mm-hmm. know. And so I think, you know, when you, you asked me about just New York, you know, also too, man, I think I'm pro and I, I don't mean this in an argument, but I'm just being honest. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm sure I'm not sure of myself, but I I have a concept that I'm trying to go for. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's important in, in with with the New York scene is you got to bring your concept to the table, bring what you what your approach is, what you sound like, and be that. You know, it's simple, man. And I for me, I was unapologetic about it. And then I wasn't I wasn't trying to be something I'm not. I'm not trying to like, you know. I, for me, I know I can dive a little bit in just about anything I want. I wanted to do that. That mm-hmm. was always my goal. My goal 
was never to just do one thing. Before jazz came along, before jazz got really like ingrained in my career, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be a lot more versatile, man. That's how I hooked up with Snarky Puppy. I, I I was playing with Cecile. I was on the road with Cecile in North North Sea Jazz Festival and sat in with Snarky at a late night jam session. Hmm. I think the video is online. If you look up like Snarky Puppy North Sea Jam, mm-hmm. it's like my first time sitting in with them. They've known me from playing jazz gigs and being on the same festival circuit. I go sit in with them. Mike's like, bro, we got to play. He calls me for a tour. Wow. Literally from, I'm not on a, like that's a completely different sound change. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me though, like I've always wanted to do that. That's been my goal. My goal was never to be like the next Philly Joe or the next, my goal was to be the, the, the most versatile or, I want it to be, and I still want to be, a versatile music supporter. Yeah. Period. Versatile, understanding what I'm doing, music supporter. Be able to dive in at times. You know, like, you, you need some fire. All drummers need some fire. You mm-hmm. know? You, you got to, and whatever your fire is, that's what you have to work to decide. But you need, because music calls for it sometimes. Yeah. You know? You need some some kind of fire. And I'm not saying you got to have all the technique in the world, you know, but you got to understand enough about music to know what you need to know how to do. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? It's like it's like a hand and a hand and foot, you know, <laughs> you know, combination. Like I can't I can't deal like Larnell or Snarky Puppy. Like Larnell is also one of his biggest freaking genius attributes is he's super musical. Yeah. Like extremely, musical, yeah, you know, orchestrationally around the drum set and just, yeah, heavy. heavy. Spud, Spud is a, a actually Spud. I call Spud Spud an uncle. He's like an uncle because Spud. He's one of those guys who's checked out a lot of music and people don't know it. <laughs> a lot of stuff, but you, when you talk to him, you wouldn't know it. And then he's like, "Wait a minute, hold on, like." He's like really dived into like early Zig and like early like oh man so he's he's heavy into that kind of thing like James Black he's like on some you know I, Idris I don't like the I'm not being very biased to New Orleans drummers but I will say this and I mean this very very like with the utmost respect I personally think that all drummers should check out the history of the drum situation in New Orleans bro I mm-hmm. think it's different, bro. I, I think it is if you look at Warren Baby Dodds, if you look at like the transition from him, Asai Frazier, who are like these guys were playing trad, like the traditional. They were like they were playing on both sides of Canal Street. Yeah. You know, you you know the whole thing about Canal Street and like how the the con- the other side of Canal Street is Congo Square. Right. You know, together. And then the other side of Canal Street is where, you know, your Rex and your other parades where you had the Dixieland concept. Right. On one side it was called New Orleans traditional music. On one side it was called Dixieland. You know? Mm-hmm. That's that whole you, I know you've heard this this whole debate of the nineteen seventeen or first original jazz recording. Right. You know. But Louis Armstrong, what made him so special is that he played on both sides of Canal Street. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Louis Armstrong was like literally the embodiment of what we want out of a president. Like somebody <laughs> just got along with everybody. You feel me? Mm-hmm. So long story short, the New Orleans drum lineage, bro, is heavy like that. Yeah. Because if you look at Warren Baby Dodds, like you're talking about guys before there was a hi-hat symbol. Freaking Louis Barbaran, bro. No hi-hat. Man. He played no hi-hat, bro. Listen to what he's playing. No hi-hat. It, it wasn't there yet. Right. <laughs> and when it came along, he still didn't play it. Right. <laughs> So you get him, and then you work your way up. We you know we can go up to like even like uh, Idris Muhammad is from here, mm-hmm. from New Orleans, and I'm not from here. But one of the reasons I moved here was for this stuff. Like I, 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 I noticed early that there was some real juice going on down here, bro. The yeah. early R&B recordings with Earl Palmer, bro, mm-hmm. or, bro, like freaking uh, them Fats Domino records with um with um shoot 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 hold on. I'm dropping these uh I'm dropping these names. It's not Earl Palmer. Play with uh Fast Domino. <laughs> <sighs> Shoot, man. 
Oh, I just watched a video of him too. Smokey Johnson. <laughs> Smokey Johnson, bro. Check out Smoke. Like these drummers, bro. Smokey Johnson to me is like one of the funkiest drummers before we get to Zig, bro. Yeah. Zig is like, this is who he was checking out. Right. You get the Zig, you start to work your way up through Zig, and you know, you got your Hurley Rollins, your Shannon Powells, of course, who when you hear them play, they're known as jazz drummers, but bro, they play everything. Yeah. You hear Hurley Riley play? Yeah. Hurley Riley is heavy. You know who else I dig from New Orleans is Arthur Latin. Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, man. Bro, see, and I'm not trying to be completely biased about New Orleans drumming, but what I'm trying to tell, what, what I hate, I hate. Terry Lynn Carrington told me this. I'm giving you some interesting stories right now because Terry Lynn Carrington, she called me after the Monk competition. Wow. Never forget this. She was a judge. And so she said to me, she said, you know, I wanted to hear you explore a little bit more on the drums. You know, I want to hear you explore, you know. And she said, um, uh, uh, yeah, you know, like the New Orleans thing can be kind of limited. And, uh, bro, I didn't even say I was doing New Orleans things. Like, I don't even know. Like, first of all, when I played, I don't even think I even was approaching anything with a New Orleans flair. Like, but she just thought that it was limited what mm-hmm. I was doing. And so I never forget this conversation because I remember thinking to myself, bro, the drums come from this place. <laughs> like, the drums have so much essence and history, not just jazz, but funk. Bro, you James Black, you hear recordings of James Black play? He sounds like Vinny. He sounds like Vinny, Dave Weckl, and freaking Tony Williams. <laughs> so what, what what I'm getting at here is though, there's a lot of history in the amount and the variety of cats and what they were doing with the drumming here. And I think that a lot of drummers will get a lot out of checking out what happened here with the drums. I I agree. And and you know talking about talking about song and dance like no matter what time period you're looking at no matter what style you're looking at if you're a drummer in new orleans and you can't support a song and make people dance you're not going to be a drummer in new orleans you are not going to be a drummer you are very right they don't give a darn about (laughs) you like i mean uh, yeah bro you know yeah man you're right bro it uh, playing songs too bro it's old tricks too it's like when you're playing blues, like you ever notice some of the blues drummers when they play like a, like, a, like a tune like that? Yeah. And you ever notice sometimes that they play the bass drum and keep playing it? They be like... Uh-huh. With the, with the bass drum, boom, 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 boom. Bro, it, Earl Palmer, we play some of those grooves with a rod cymbal, and he be playing the bass drum and putting the accent on two and four, like boom, boom, bop. Boom, 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 with the snare drum, boom. Right. And you hear the records and you're like, man, that groove. And you ever notice when you try to play the groove on a groove on a gig, like a blues gig? Yep. You try to play like, mm, do, get, do, do, do. and it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Like, it's it, not feeling the same. It does. A, it turns into the Stevie Ray Vaughan Texas thing. With, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, heavy on, heavy on the one, heavy snare on the two, but not like, not that together kind of rolling yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But you know, that's just something small that I think we if we peep what was going on, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and it's honestly there's I mean, bro, there's, there's I mean, bro, Roy Brooks and Roger Humphreys out of Pittsburgh, man, those guys, they got a whole history there too. Uh the, the Chicago avant-garde scene, like yeah. Andrew Surreal and those cats. I mean, bro, there's perspective we can get from everywhere, but I think there's definitely some more attention that can be paid to what happened, especially in that jazz funk concert. Funk, especially. If you play funk and you don't know about the funkness that (laughs) took place in New Orleans, bro, you can't possibly tell me. Like, come on, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What is your harmonic training, and and how how do other musicians uh, sort of react to to you being the the leader from the drum chair? Ooh, that's good. That's real good. Um, my harmonic training. Uh, I mean, I, 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 
I, I understand harmony. <laughs> yeah. I understand harmony uh, on a deep level. I think I think I do. Uh, I think I have a pretty good grasp of harmony. I'm the kind of drummer where if you're playing a voicing that I do not like, I will tell you um, that I don't like that voicing. Um, I will also tell you how I want it to be voiced. You know, like, for example, Rick, he actually, Rick is actually not a good example because he's always spot on. He really the- is. It's maddening. <laughs> <laughs> He, he nails it. And then he helps. We'll be in rehearsal. And I'm like, Chris, no, nah, voice that chord with the, the nine in the bottom. Put the nine like a cluster, like one, two. You know, like, yeah. I'm always, like, talking about ways I want stuff voiced. Like, can you come down on lower register to piano? You know, stay out of the high register on this. You know, I'm always thinking of that. Because for me, it's production. It's producing. It's all about the entire sound of the band. Even with bass, sometimes the bass goes up high, and I'm like, "Nah, doing that section, make sure you stay low. I need you, stay grounded." You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a section of a song we do called Epiphany, where basically the beginning section is kind of a band improv- improvised moment, and so I never forget the first day. It's like we, it's an E, and basically the band plays an E major chord. We're like E major, kind of like E op E sus E major, like really just open E beautiful E diatonic E, and so I never forget telling the band like I don't. The first time we did it, it got dark. Everybody started playing like E minor. Mm. E started kind of diving into some other areas, diminish. And I said, Nah, man, keep it diatonic. Like keep it beautiful. I want it to be angelic. Like I want it to be all beautiful. This is supposed to be like a beautiful moment, right? And the band caught on, you know, I would talk about patience. I would talk about, you know, uh, creating a motif based on what you're hearing from your other band members. I'm really into that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty invested in that cause I'm singing, man. So I, I feel all that. Yeah. I'm singing, you know, it's another thing that jazz is missing is hooks. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> hooks, man. Hooks, bro. I can't <laughs> wait to hear. I can't wait to hear this next record. man. Oh my God. The hooks, bro. Oh, this is crazy. I'm excited. I'm nervous at the same time because whenever you step out to do something like this, it's always, you know, nothing's ever just easy. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but I think if it turns out the way I somewhat hear it in my head, you know, yeah, hooks, man. Yeah, bro. Rick, Rick, I'm sure Rick will, will tell you the first song me and Rick wrote had um, an amazing hook to it. And Rick was like, oh, man, bro, that's a vibe. Like, <laughs> Immediately, you know. So anyway, and then I'll say, so leading on to, you know, the band, you know, how they react to me being on the drums. The funny part is there's less margin for error. And I don't mean that in a bad way, like they they, they can't mess up. They won't mess up as much as they would if I wasn't on the drums. And the reason why is because I'm really dominant. Like Mm. I want a downbeat. I'm like, boom. And you can't help but by me being in the middle of the stage, downbeat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You can't help it. Like, you cannot help. So it's like, even in that section of Epiphany, man, there's times where I'll speed the tempo up or I'll slow it way down or rebottle it. Like, I'll do a cymbal wash, which means, wait a minute, something's about to happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so there's ways that the drums has a lot of power. Yeah. Know? I mean, it has. A, it, they have a lot of power to begin with, but with you front and center, the way you the way you set up, like you have the ability to actually conduct the band. Big time. I agree. And they don't. I have. I have the, the gig I'm doing in Boston and uh, Cape May tomorrow. I'm doing like Exit Zero Jazz Festival, like Philadelphia, Cape May area. And, bro, I have a new band. I have, like, some guys who play with me once, but everybody else is busy. Rick's going to be there, which just makes it easier. But right. I can't have Rick. Bro, when I don't have Rick on a gig, it's like, oh. Yeah, it's security bro. blanket, man. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. Because uh, talking to the guitar chair is like, um, check out these live recordings right here. Yeah. You know? Long story short, it's going to be a new band, new bass player, new new piano player. And... You know, I'm we'll sound check. I'm not gonna rehearse everything. I don't like to rehearse a lot. You know, we sound check and then we get live, just follow me. Mm-hmm. Watch me. You know, I'll give it all to you, you know, because it's hard for me to explain what's gonna happen because I don't know yet. Mm. And so that's the luxury I love about being on drums, singing, being in the front. Cause man, literally, there's no music. I hate music on the bandstand. I hate charts on yep. the bandstand. Like 
that just to me it disconnects you from the audience. Yep. Like audience is like music stands. Like no, like yeah. up. You know what I mean? Like yep. long story short, it's definitely a lot of benefits, and I haven't found any negatives yet, man. To be honest with you, like it's really all benefits because it's just even when we're playing ballads, man. Like simple stuff, like. You know, of course, me singing and playing drums, tempo-wise, I have a different perspective on tempo, too, man. I don't think tempo should be absolute. I think tempo should be, you know, moment felt. Hmm. You know, so if it's if it's going to be, uh, if the tempo is going to be slower than normal, it's because the moment says it needs to be slower. The moment says it needs to be faster. Yeah. The moment, I'm all about that. And so they'll tell you, sometimes I'm in a song. And we'll get to a section and I want to slow it down. I'll slow it down. Like we'd be one of those free nights. You know, when you're on the road, you have those nights where it's like, wait a minute, everything sounded different that night. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because that night was free and inspiration was striking all of us in a different way. And maybe this night I took this one section and slowed it way down. We have we can do that really quickly. Yeah. You know, like Well that that's cool because like one of the one of the things I talked about with Todd Strait in when we talked about playing drums behind a singer is that, that you know, the, the drummer has more power than anyone to make a singer uncomfortable and it's because of tempo. Right. <laughs> um, but, but you, like you, you have both those powers and, and uh, you know, the only person it affects is you. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. Which means, yeah. And you know what? It actually, to be honest, uh, uh, just to have another perspective of this for a band member, it might, I don't know, Rick Rick probably loves it because Rick is just such a musician. He's a musician's musician. Yeah. But I can definitely tell that some of the other band members can, if you're not used to it, it can get aggravating for you because I have so much power. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. To have a different perspective of it, like if I'm with somebody else, of course, you know, as a side man, I don't have that much power. I'm not trying to have that much power anyway. Right. I'm trying to, you know, support but not have that much power. And it's not that I'm actually trying to have it in my own band. It's just default. It's just, I happen to be singing. I have to be, pl- I, I actually, I happen to be playing the drums. So it's like, okay, if we're going to do this, you know, like it's like, whatever I do, you, it's almost like they have no choice. Right. You know? Right. You, you have that power to like, uh, you, you can, the, you, the decisions you want to make as a leader are not the same as, as a trumpet player, who's a leader or a pianist. So first of all, that's going to throw people off. But then, like, you'll actually use that power and make those decisions. And <laughs> I definitely do, man. Sometimes I start B sections. Like one time, oh man, we were in a gig and we were running short on time, and I just started singing the bridge. <laughs> we was Chris was playing a solo over the first A section, and I just. If you hear a call, bang, and and the whole band, like, <laughs> on it, was, it. <laughs> it was like, cause what I did was normally it's like, if you hear a call on a downbeat, but I did was I sung it before I hit the downbeat. <laughs> they heard it. So I was like, the, for if you, I was like, uh, if you hear a Call yeah, yeah. On the downbeat, it was actually a vibe. Yeah, and the fact that the fact that you're the drummer and you're front and center, and everybody can see you, they could not only hear you coming in, but they could see your downbeat coming, stick up in the air, like we're going, bitches here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's exactly. That's yeah. so cool, man. Yeah, man, it's fun though, man. I'm still developing it though, bro. To be honest with you, it's all. Because it's new, man. You know, I mean, I've been singing all my life as it's been a part of me. Drums, I've been playing. But this concept is still kind of, you know, it's it's unfolding, you know. And I've yeah. had it through it, you know. I think, it's, I think it's uncharted territory. I'm trying to think of another band leader, singer, drummer who's set up front and center. Like, has it been done before? Um, no, I actually researched it, to be honest with you. It hasn't been. <laughs> I mean, even no- even Phil Collins and Don Henley were still in the back. Yeah, uh, Anderson Pack. You know Anderson Pack? Uh huh. Anderson Pack is a uh, probably he's he's a hip hop artist who sings and plays the drums and raps. Hmm. And bro, he's big right now. He's actually he's he's pretty big. I, I check him out a lot. He's still kind of not the same vibe. The thing is, too, to be honest with you, Zach, it's the way I'm singing that really makes it kind of a. It's not like I'm. It's like I'm really singing. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's what changes it a little bit. 
that's what makes it really kind of like, wait a minute. It's not, it's the setup, it's all that. But I think just from what in my experience, what really takes people for a shock is the fact that I'm singing, when I'm singing a ballad on the drums, like with brushes. And yeah. I'm like, bel- I'm belting this ballad. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, that's that's where it gets trippy. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also when I start to play by myself, when we're getting like, you know, when it gets like really active, and this, this, you know, I think that's where it gets kind of like. Those are some of the things that I noticed that I'm going to also accentuate, and I'm 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 exploring upon, like even the next record, you know, because it's all learning for me, man. So I'm I'm still checking it out, checking out the concept, learning how to do it, how to how to evolve with it, and mm-hmm. so. There's moments that I notice that okay, wait a minute, this is uncharted territory. Like this is really something, you know, re- revolutionary. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like this yeah. is, something, you know. So it's all. But you're right, Phil Collins. I'm trying to think of in jazz, nobody. Yeah, like Bobby Durham, maybe. In rock, I'm I'm thinking of uh, I'm thinking of Levon Helm. Aha. <laughs> because like he, you know, you're obviously very very different from levon in in many ways but like the vibe the vibe of his drumming matched the vibe of his singing Mm. you know i love that i love that yeah and i can totally see that in you yeah we're gonna see what happens over time you know it's funny man i i you know with this with with the new music you know it's so many things play into it and i mean i'm at a point now just in general where I'm not trying to figure it out. You know, I'm just trying to be in the moment and be as creative as possible. Music led. Cause to me, when you start to try to figure it out, the, it, it all gets, you know, the juice leaves. You know? <laughs> and so for me, I, I recognize what's good about it. What's, what's kind of special about it. What's difficult about it. Recognize the entire perspective of what it is. And then I just try to like, honestly keep, you know, treating it like it's like my little baby girl, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't know, so, and every day is something new, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's my approach, man. Well, it's it's a beautiful thing, man. It's great to see. Yeah, man. I, I appreciate you for talking to me. Yeah, that. yeah. Thank you for so, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, yeah. And uh, it was, it was really great to hear about what you're, what you're up to and how you're, how you're putting it together. Yeah, man. One day at a time, bro. One day at a time, man. For cool. Real. Thanks so much, man. I catch you, bro. I told you, quick mind and good spirit. I really dug that talk with Jameson. Uh, it was refreshing and encouraging for me to hear how he's forming his jazz concept. I think he's trying to move jazz forward in an accessible way, uh, and I'm all for that. There are some videos of Jameson on the page for this episode at workingdrummer.net. Uh, one with his band and one of him just singing and accompanying himself on the drums solo. I highly recommend you check those out, uh, seeing him combine all the ideas and influences you heard him talk about into this cohesive concept is really cool, and apart from that, his singing is just incredible. We're still conducting our survey at workingdrummer.net. If you take a minute to fill it out, you'll be entered to win some cool stuff from Aquarian Drumheads. We appreciate you participating in that way. We also appreciate you subscribing on iTunes and leaving a rating and review for us there and following us on social media and sharing pics of your gigs using the hashtag Working Drummer. I appreciate Mike Jackson for his technical assistance and Matthew Kraus for getting it all started. And I appreciate you for listening. As they say in the South, I appreciate you. Take care, everyone. Back next week.